why, you know. It's good to see Pamela and Danny this morning. I didn't give them, you, you ought to be thankful. Pastor was kind and gracious this morning. They both, one of them graduated from Georgia Tech. One of them hopefully is going to graduate from Georgia Tech. And they played somebody in football yesterday. I'm not sure who that was. Well, the other team played. We'll just say that, all right? And I didn't say anything this morning to them, so I wanted to be an encouragement, all right? Y'all try to encourage me next week after we play, okay? All right? Anybody else? Very quickly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Brother Josh? Uh, thank you for, you know, I mean, you said before, the church family and, and the friends we have here, you know, it, no matter what's going on in life, what's going on in the week, uh, it was, you know, it's good to be able to come here and visit with you, Charlie. Amen. So, really. Amen. That's a blessing, isn't it? The church isn't the battleground. The church is the hospital. Amen. It's where we come to get help and healed and go out and fight the battle. Amen? We need to remember that. Always keep that spirit. Amen. Miss Brenda. Amen. Amen. Well, I try to do my best. My wife does a good job writing sermons, so that's all my help. Amen. So, all right. Anybody else? Very quickly. Yes, ma'am. Miss Mitty? Amen. 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 There are times in our life we don't feel saved, right? <laughs> but that doesn't change the fact that Jesus is still on the throne, right? Amen. All right. Somebody else, real quick. Trying to, all right. Miss Young So. I understand very well. <laughs> Amen. That's a blessing, isn't it? That's a blessing. I like that. We need to get Miss Young Soul on some of these news news uh, uh, news uh, casts. Amen. <laughs> Very good. She got married to Brother Tony. It took three times though for him to stick. Amen. It took three times. And Miss Young Soul's Miss Young has been married three times to the same man. You said, Pastor, that's not funny. It's true. You have to ask her the story, all right? It was all legit above board, all right? And so, all right, anybody else? Very quickly. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. The Lord is good, isn't he? The Lord is good. All right, real quick. Anybody else? Clara. Your family and good church family. Amen. Perfect. All right, Psalm 73. Psalm 73. Miss Krista alluded to this just a minute ago, but she said, you know, I'm thankful for the seasons of life, good or bad. You know, God takes us through them and God grows us through them 
And one thing about every season that we go through and, is that God promised never to leave us nor forsake us. And none of us as God's people can ever say about the Lord that He left us alone. God's always with us. And I'm thankful for that. But sometimes in those seasons of life, we, we see things take place and we see things happen. And there's a question that's often to ask. Why do bad things happen to good people? And why do good things happen to bad people? And uh, there are sometimes we look at that equation and we, we can't explain it. We can't give an answer. And we, we look at our young people, we look at our children, and they're looking in a world today that from their perspective and their point of view is living the good life. And it seems like that all the good things are happening to the people who are in the world. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can look and say, it just seems like my life's been filled with one bad thing after another. We find here in Psalm 73, a Psalm of Asaph, the Bible says in verse Number one, truly God is good. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Think about that verse for just a moment. The writer says, I was envious at the foolish. When you analyze that statement, it sounds, it sounds like somebody's not thinking. I was envious at foolishness. The Bible says a fool has said in his heart there is no God. Proverbs says uh, the, the foolish man, the thought of foolishness is sin. But yet often, if we're not careful, we can become envious of the foolish. He says, and at the prosperity of the wicked. Read on down if you would, please. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compassed them about as a chain. Violence covered them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, and they have more than the heart could wish. They're corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and the waters of the full cup are wrung out unto them. And they say, How doth God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. The writer here says, I... I, I, I'm, my question is this, why is it that the wicked prospers? Why is it that bad things happen to good people and the good things happen to the bad people? And if we're not careful, every one of us, and if we're honest, every one of us could say, there have been times in my life when I've asked that same question. How many of you have ever asked that question or thought that question? Would you raise your hand? Yeah. There have been times in my life when I've thought, Lord, it seems like I'm trying to do what I'm supposed to do. And this person over here who doesn't care anything about God, who doesn't, isn't concerned about God's will or God's plan, they seem to be enjoying life. They seem to have it easy. They seem to have everything they want. Vice versa is true. We look at the world and we go, God, they have everything. And God, what do I have? Why do the bad things happen to the good people? Or why do good things happen to bad people? Why do the wicked prosper? When we think about that question and we analyze it, when we, when we look at how we're to respond to it, because as I said just a moment ago, and as you attested to in your testimony, that there have been times in my life and in your life when we've all asked the question, Lord, why? Why does this take place? Lord, why do I have to go through this? Why do I have to face this? Why do I have to deal with this? We have to learn how to respond to that according to the Word of God. We have to learn how to respond to that properly. We have to learn to respond to that spiritually. Because if not, we can find ourselves in the same condition the writer of the 73rd Psalm was in verse number 2. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. 
My steps had well nigh slipped. The Bible says, he says, my, my foundation, everything that I was built on, it was, it was crumbling because I was looking at everything the wicked was doing and I asked the question, God, why? Why is this happening? Why am I going through this? Why am I facing this? Why us? Why me? He said, Lord, it just about drove me right into the ground. It just about did me in. It didn't seem right. And my feet had well nigh slipped. My, 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 my foundation was shaken. And if we're not careful, when we begin to go through hard times or we begin to see others prosper, if we don't have the right spiritual response, if our heart is the not, not in the right condition, it can do damage in our life. It can cause us to think things we shouldn't think. It can cause us to do things we should not do. Everybody, every one of us have been hurt at some time or another. And by that I don't mean physically, but I mean we've been hurt by people who, who have claimed to love us or we've been hurt by people that we thought loved us. And when people get hurt, we automatically get defensive. We automatically lash out. A hurt animal always defends itself. And the Bible says here, if we're not careful, verse number two, he says our feet could be almost gone, our steps could be well nigh slipped, our foundation could be shaken to its very core when we watch the wicked prosper. When we watch the wicked prosper, we could arrive at this, this conclusion, Lord, why try? Lord, why keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Why keep doing and and, and giving and serving and living for God. Lord, if, if all it is is a battle and the wicked are prospering, Lord, why not just give up? Why not just change the message, preacher? Why not just make it something that's more user-friendly? Why not make it something that's easier for everybody to accept rather than just be so dogmatic about the truth and preach it and try to uh, send forth a message that will change people's lives? Just make it comfortable for everyone. Why is it that, that churches who don't stand for anything seem to be prospering? Why is it that this, this movement or this movement takes place? Why not just give up? Because the wicked prosper. Every one of us have thought something along those lines. We felt that way. And the Bible gives us here in Psalm 73 our response, the Christian's response when the wicked prosper. The Christian's response when the wicked prospers. I'm going to give them to you very quickly tonight. And hopefully they'll be a blessing to you. Look in with me if you would please. In verse number one, when the wicked prosper, number one, we need to look back. Paul said in the book of Philippians, forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Can I say to you, it's good for us to forget the world in which the world we left behind. It's good for us to get, forget that wickedness that we were involved in. It's good for us to, to not desire to go back to that, but to reach forth to what God has given us. But it is good in our life when we look back, look in verse number one, and see truly God is good. Every one of us could stop and look back and remind ourselves of the things that God has blessed our life with. How many of us have often gone through hard times and we've had that attitude, Lord, I'm suffering, I'm struggling, I'm dealing with this difficulty. And look at, look at this guy here at work, or look at this family, they don't care anything about you. And look at the blessing, and look at the goodness in their life. Every one of us can often remember those bad times. And if we're not careful, that's all we'll remember. Have you ever thought about this? It's so much easier to remember the difficulty rather than the blessing. It's so much easier to remember how hard it was, remember how challenging it was, or remember what I went through, rather than remembering what God delivered me from. Remembering how God took care of me. Remembering how God supplied that need. We'll have a hundred, you've heard me say it, we'll have a hundred good days and one bad day, and the only day we can remember is the bad day. 
We need to look back. When we see the wicked prosper, we must look back and remind ourselves, hey, truly God is good. God has been good. You say, Pastor, how do you know? Because every one of us have been blessed. God has to know me. God not only has to know me, God has to know where I am. God knows when we're discouraged and God knows when we're down and God knows when we need that encouragement and God knows when we're right there on the edge and we're ready to say, you know what, I'm done, I give up. And I don't know if you're there tonight. I don't know why God has me preaching this message, but I'll tell you this, it's in those moments when, you're, when your feet are nigh to slipping and your foundation is shaking and you're wondering why bad things are happening to the good people and the good things are happening to the bad people. It's in those moments when you need to stop and remind yourself, listen, we may be going through a difficulty now, we may be struggling now, but I want you to look back at how good God has been to us. God knows where I am. God knows what I'm dealing with. God knows my circumstance. Not only does God know me, God knows where I am, but God knows the condition of my heart. God knows the condition of my heart. It's the moments of our life that we feel our strongest that we're most susceptible to failure. It's the moments of our life that we feel our strongest that we're most susceptible to failure. But it is the moments in our life that we feel that we cannot handle anymore that we see just how good God is to us. We just see how good God can be when He lifts the burden, when He takes the load of that, that circumstance or that situation and He takes care of us because He knows the condition of our heart. He knows the condition of our life. We're in the middle of football season. and In football season, during a game, players get hurt. They have injuries and things take place and they're not able to finish the game and maybe it takes a couple of weeks for them to get back into their routine or take care of their responsibility. Listen, God knows when we're hurt. God knows when our hearts are heavy. God knows, God knows when we don't need someone to beat us up. We need someone to love us up. I've been there before. I've been there before. I'm learning more and more about myself and learning more as I grow and get older and get wiser. I don't say get older, but get wiser. You know what? Most of the time, I don't have to tell people. And nobody, and most of the time, people don't have to tell me when I'm wrong. I know it already. I said this morning, a lot of times, if we're not careful as churches and as Christians, hey, we should always stand for truth, right? We shouldn't trade the truth for anything. We're not going to compromise the truth because of people's feelings. But there are a lot of times we'll focus on those fleshly sins and walk right past those spiritual ones. We'll walk right past those spiritual sins. And there, there's times in every one of our lives when we don't need somebody to get in our face and point a finger at us and tell us how sorry we are and how we need to shake, shape it up or ship out. That's not what we need to hear. We need somebody to come up behind us and put their arm around us and tell us they love us. I'm here with you. Why? Because God knows the condition of our heart. By the way, anybody can throw a fit. Somebody says, well, I don't feel like loving that person. Do you know that God never, never told us that love was a feeling? Amen. Study your Bible. God doesn't never tell us that love is a feeling. Love is a command. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. This is the first commandment. He said the second is this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. God never said love him if you feel like it. He commanded us to love him. What does that mean, Pastor Brian? That means that love goes beyond your feeling. That means that your love for your neighbor, that means your love for your brother and sister in Christ, that means your love for those that have hurt you, those that you need to help, your love for them has more to do with your love for Christ than it does with your love for them. Because He's the one that's commanded us to love them. And because I love Him, I'll do whatever He asks me to do. 
He says we're to look back. Why? Because God truly is good. And when we don't love people, and that doesn't mean we accept everything. Let's, let's clear something up. We can love people without accepting what they're doing. Loving people doesn't mean we lower the standard of what is right and wrong. Help me now. Don't die on me here. Loving people doesn't mean we lower the standard of what is right and wrong. But God's commanded us to love them. And we can love them when we look back at how God has loved us. God knows me. God knows what I'm going through. And God knows the condition of my heart. And God says, I've been good. He says, we're to look back. When we see the wicked prosper, and we go through these challenges, and it seems like all the good things are happening to everybody else. He said, look back, because God truly is good. The second thing that I want you to see is not only that we're to look back because God has truly been good. As a matter of fact, look with me, if you would, please, in verse number one again. He says, God truly is good. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. I read that verse and I thought, you know, I emphasize the point there on you know, God. God is good. Truly God is good. But when we think about the fact that God is good to us. Understand this, God's first concern in our life is our heart. Well, here's what we like to think. Well, God is good to me when I get that new car. God is good to me when I get that new house. Or God is good to me when I get that surprise check in the mail. Or God is good to me when I, when I get that extra blessing. No, no, no. God is good to us because He changed our eternal destiny. If we got nothing else and we get more than that, but if we got nothing else, if all God gave to us was eternity, God truly is good. The second thing that I want you to see is not only that God says when we see the wicked prosper, look back at how good God has been. But secondly, he says this. Look with me in verse number two. He says, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death. But their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compassed them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with a fatness. They have more than their heart could wish. The second thing we are to do is, number one, look back. But secondly, look around. Look around. What is Asaph saying here? He's saying, He's telling his, his psalm is this. He says, look at all that the wicked are doing. Look at all that the wicked are doing. We need to be careful. We need to remind ourselves. We need to be careful about what we use to measure success. Look, look at what the Bible says. Look at, look at what the Bible says about, uh, about the psalmist here. Look in verse number three. He says, for I was envious at the foolish. He was envious at the foolish, listen, when I saw their prosperity. He was envious of their prosperity. Can I tell you, the world will never do for you what God can do for you. The world can never provide for you what God can provide for you. Can I, can I go a step further? We cannot produce in our own life what only God can produce in our life. He was envious at the wicked because of their prosperity. Look at this. He was envious not only because of their prosperity, but look up with me, please, in verse number 6. He said, Therefore pride compassed them about as a chain, and violence covereth them as a garment. He was envious not only of their prosperity, but of their pride. Their pride. Church family, Christian, let me remind you. The Bible says that pride goeth before destruction, and the Holy Spirit before the fall. We understand what happens when we are prideful, but I want you to understand something. There is nothing wrong with taking pride in what God has done in your life. There's nothing wrong with not being ashamed of how God has changed us. The Bible says he was envious of their pride. He was envious of their prosperity. Look with me, if you would, please, in verse number 9. He says in verse number, in verse number 7, he says, Their eyes stand out with a fatness. They have more heart than, than the heart could wish for, could wish. They're corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and the waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. He was envious of their popularity. 
Church, think for just a moment. God commanded us, you're going to have to choose who you're going to serve. You're going to have to serve man or you're going to serve God. And our idea of popularity should be, Lord, I want to be popular in your eyes, not in the eyes of the world. I want to be, I want to be what I should be. I want you, God, to be pleased, not man to be pleased. We begin to look around. It's, it's amazing how, how skewed our vision becomes when we begin to look at the wrong things. Well, look at all this that the world possesses. The world cannot provide what God can provide. Look at all this that the world has accomplished. Look at what God has accomplished in your life. Well, wait a minute. Look at them. Everybody loves them. God loves me. Their popularity, their pride, their prosperity. We begin to look at the wrong things. We begin to look at those things and we begin to use those things. We begin to use their circumstances to measure success. By the way, stop for just a moment. Everyone's circumstances change. Everyone's circumstances change. He said, look back. He said, look within. Then look at the next part of the passage, if you would, please. Skip down with me, if you would, please. He said, look around and look at verse number 13. Verily, verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of my children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. The third thing, he said that we're to look back. He said we're to look around. He said, thirdly, look within. Look within. When we begin to measure success by the world's definition, and we begin to measure happiness based upon a worldly definition, it should reveal to us that there is something wrong with our heart. When we, begin to look at, when we begin to look at the happiness that the world offers and begin and we begin to desire that, then it should send a red flag up in our life. Hey, something's not right in my heart. Love not the world, neither the things that, in, that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know what you've done? You've replaced your love for God with a love for the world. And I'm not saying you're out there wicked, loving, it, loving up the world, living in the world. I'm not talking about that. But you're beginning to measure, you're beginning to, to measure, and you're beginning to reveal about yourself that the opinions and the ideas of men are more valuable to you than the ideas and opinions that God has given us. He said, look within. Everything we need in life, we find in Jesus. Everything you'll ever need in life, you find in Christ. And the moment that something else becomes necessary for you to be happy is the moment that you've replaced Christ with whatever that is. It's not God plus something. It's Christ alone. The fourth thing. He said that we're to look back, we're to look around, we're to look within, but look what he says here, if you would please, in verse number 16. He says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I therein. Then understood I therein. Surely thou didst set them in the slippery places, and thou cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh. So, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved. And I was pricked in my reign. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was a beast before thee. The next thing we have to do is not only look back. and We have to look around and we have to look within. But we have to look up. Look what the Bible says. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. That, that sanctuary, that house of the Lord was a place of worship. And when you and I stop for just a moment, pay attention, don't miss it. 
when we come into the presence of God, when we come into the presence of the Lord, there is nothing that measures even close. When we come to the house of God and God is present, when God moves, and I've been in church services where it wasn't a preacher, it wasn't a song, it was the presence of God that stirred the heart of God's people. And guess what? Nothing else mattered. Get our eyes off ourselves and get our eyes on Jesus. Keep our eyes off of everybody else and get our eyes on the Lord. It's in those moments in our life when we're sitting in our corner with sucking our thumb and listen, everything that we may go through and everything that seems that we go through is legitimate, I promise. And nothing is real until it is personal. And when you're going through it, it seems like the worst that's ever happened. But I want you to understand something, that no matter what that is, when you get a fresh vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you come into the presence of God, when you see God for who He is, everything else flees. Because that is all that matters. Our, our, we, we talk about our country. The Bible makes it very plain and very clear that the problems in the world today are not a result of the world. Let me make that statement again. That the problems in this world today are not a result of the world. It's a result of God's people missing out and losing a vision for who God is. And seeing the importance of God in our life. And not only in our life, but in our families and in our churches, friend. Listen to me. I, I love the fact that this church loves people. I love the fact that our church is a giving church. I love the fact that our church is a, is a friendly church. I love the fact that our church is a wonderful church. We have been blessed. But listen, I'll trade all of that for the presence of God. Maybe I need to say that again. None of that matters if God isn't present. If God's not here, we're nothing more than a social club. If God's not here, we're nothing more than a get-together with people who are kind and friendly. I'll trade it all for the presence of the Lord. Why? Because it is Christ that makes the difference in our life. It is Christ that causes all of that that we struggle with to flee. Because greater is He that's in me than he that is in the world. Look up. Get your eyes off yourself. Get your eyes off the world and get your eyes on Jesus. And there's no better place to do that than in the house of God. The last thing, and we'll be done this evening. He said that we're to look back and he said that we're to look around and we're to look within. He said we're to look up, but look with me if you would please in the latter part of the chapter. If you turn the page, the Bible says in verse number 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides thee. Boy, we could, we could learn a lot from that statement. We have people in heaven that we know and love that we can't wait to see. But heaven is not heaven without Jesus. Heaven is not heaven because our loved ones are there. Heaven is heaven because God is there. He says, there's nothing in heaven but thee. There is none upon this earth that I desire besides thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, that, lo they that are far from thee shall perish Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. And I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. The last place you need to look is ahead. He said, look ahead. Well, man, Pastor Brian, you don't know how bad it is on this earth. Can I tell you, anything we go through on this earth is nothing compared to eternity. You see, we need to learn to live that way. We have too many of us as adults teaching the generation that comes behind us that happiness is found in money. Happiness is found in possessions. Happiness is found in relationships. We're teaching them that's the happiness. Friend, there is no happiness except from God. I believe that when two people get married, they get married because God's brought them together. 
or they should get married because the Lord has brought them together. And there's happiness in a marriage when, when God is the center of that marriage. And when God is the center of our life, we behave and we act in a way that is honoring to Him. Therefore, we enjoy that joy of the Lord. But without God, there is no joy. He said we're to look, we're to look ahead. Look what He says here. God, here's what He says. Look what He says in verse number 23. We'll be done. Nevertheless, I'm continually with thee. I want you to see about this when we, when we think about looking ahead. Number one, I want you to see God is present. God's not this idea that's way far away. God's not this mythical legend, this story that's been told, friend. God is present. Not only is God present, but He says, look, He says, Nevertheless, I am continually with, with, with thee. Look in the latter part of verse 23. Thou hast holden me at my right hand. Thou hast. Not only is God present, but God has been present in the past. You follow me? God has been present in the past. Whenever I was going through what I was going through in the past, guess what? God was present then. God is present now, and God was present then. He says, Thou hast hold of me. Lord, I remember when, Lord, you were present. God is present. God has been present. Look in verse 24. And thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. In the future, guess what? God will be present. Have you ever thought about that? God always has been, and God is now. And guess what, Marcos? God always will be. And guess who God is? He's my God. He's my provider. He's my redeemer. He's my sustainer. He is my strength. He is my help. Look at with me, if you would, please, in verse number, in verse number 26. He said, my flesh, he said, my flesh and my heart faileth. And I tell you, before we ever fail in the flesh, before we ever fail physically, we fail in our heart. Before ever, a person ever gives up physically, they give up on the inside. And the Lord says, listen, that God, my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God says, listen, I've been present in the past. I am present now and I will be present in the future. And he says, that God, that God is my strength. That God is is the God that's my portion. That God provides. That God takes care of me. That God sustains me. Look what he says in verse number 28. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God. Why? Why did God sustain us? Why did God watch over us? Why did God take care of us? Why did God see us through it? That I may declare all thy works. You know what God says to us? Or you know what we have to say? When we look at all the struggles that we have and all the blessings that the world has, when we look at the prosperity and the popularity of this world, and we see the hard times that often fall at our feet, you know what we have to say when God sees us through it? Look what God has done. It wasn't my strength. It wasn't my ability. My feet were ready to slip. I was ready to give up and walk away. But God strengthened me. He sustained me and He saw me through it. When bad things happen to good people, when good things happen to bad people, look back. Look around. Look within. Look up. And look ahead. God is good. No matter how challenging it gets, we can always remind ourselves God is good. Let's pray. Lord, thank you tonight for all you do for us. Thank you for blessing us and watching over us. Thank you for, Lord, taking care of us. 